hi dad <laughs> oh, everybody that's so funny is that your dad at the top um yeah there he is yeah. that's it. oh hi dan <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our first spring reading. It's so exciting. Um, I had dreams that in March I was going to be able uh, to be sitting here in a sleeveless top and, and whatever, but uh, I'm happy the sun came out today after all the rain. Uh, I've been so excited to talk to Sarah Kerchak about her memoir, I Overcame Autism and got this lousy anxiety disorder. It is a very funny book, um, insightful, intelligent, like all of the positives I can say uh, a, about a book, I will say about this book. It was a thoroughly enjoyable read. Um, Kaylee is going to throw up some links. I strongly recommend you consider buying it from an independent bookstore, but uh, I'm sure Sarah would be happy that you buy it from any bookstore. Um, I will open up with a land acknowledgement and then um, Kaylee, do you want to throw Sarah up so everyone can say hi? Sorry, Sarah, thank you for coming. Hi. I kind of skipped over the, uh, the, the normal script that I have. Um, everybody, this is Sarah. I'm so excited that hey. she got to join us today uh, to talk about her memoir. Um, and I will take a break now, talk about the land that we are speaking to you from today. And, uh, and then we'll get back to Sarah. I am sitting and Sarah is sitting in Tecaranto, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Wendat, Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. As some of you are outside of Toronto, I invite you to silently just acknowledge the land that you are on. Um, no pressure to do so, but uh, it is a, a great habit to get into. Sarah, thank you again for coming. Um, I want to open up uh, as uh, a reader of your work. I am interested to know what you're reading right now. Well, um, first... <laughs> I'm not technically reading this one, but uh, I do have a book review coming out, I think later today, I hope later today. Um, so I'm just going to shout out the book that I reviewed, which is um, Tetsia in the Naked. It's a photo book of my favorite professional wrestler ever. Um, this is not why he's my favorite, but it certainly is um, remarkable. Um, as a former personal trainer, I have to say his muscles are a work of art in of themselves. Um, and it's just like, it's a ridiculous book, but it's also incredibly well made. And just the pure joie de vivre, as I'll say in the review, if anyone's like morbidly curious to actually read 1300 words on a naked photo book, um, and no one has ever been as happy to be naked as this young man has been happy to be naked and just to get him to see just to see him do all these like ridiculous booty shot and cheesecake shots and just having the time of his life just makes me so happy for him and happy for the world to get to enjoy this so um Tetsia in the naked um but in terms of actual reading I haven't done a ton since the book came out um Obviously, there, here there's stuff going on in the world that's stressing people out and making focus hard. And also just because, you know, releasing my book into this was another layer of stress. Uh, but what I have started is, um, But You Don't Look Autistic at All by Bianca Toops. Um, also an autistic woman with pink hair on her cover. <laughs> um, Bless her for reaching out because, you know, I grew up in the 80s of the like Smurfette generation where there could only ever be one woman and having the stress of that. Um, and there's always a panic of the few spots that actually autistic voices get in the world. And oh my God, if there's another woman out there, does my story mean anything? So I sort of looked at it as, the, as like the Highlander. I was like, oh God, there's like two pink haired white women and she's prettier than me. She's getting the spot. <laughs> um, but she reached out to me and offered me a copy of the book and we've been able to chat about it and, you know, joke about it. Neither of us have pink hair anymore. Um, and I've been really thrilled to read it so far. It's kind of funny the way our existences are the same and aren't the same. Um, obviously, 
pink hair, white women, but she's from the Netherlands. Um, both of our um, acknowledgement pages have hiragana in them. She uses the present tense for arigato wow. gozaimasu. I say arigato, arigato gozaimashita. Um, but, in, but beyond that, yeah, it's a little different. She's like wearing cute cartoon dogs on the cover of her shirt. You can't really see it on the cover of mine, but I'm wearing cartoon boobs. Um, <laughs> and she was born on my half birthday two years later. Uh, so August 7th, I'm February 7th. So in the first chapter, even when I go like February 7th, 1982, she's like August 7th, 1984. Um, wow. But her prose is like so much, so much sharper and clearer and concise. And I'm not saying that to shit on my own prose. It's just that I write kind of like I talk, which is more like the rambly, got to encompass every single thing in a single sentence, kind of autistic. And she's more like the scientific precise I said a sentence that had four words in it and it said everything kind of autistic. So yeah. we cover a like lot poetry. of the same territory, but in such different ways that even though, you know, we probably don't need a third pink haired white autistic woman in the world, I do feel like our books both contribute to that. So that's really exciting. And then um, a poetry collection that I got sort of at the beginning of the pandemic and that I've been revisiting. This is by Sari Jarell Johnson, um, who is an autistic poet. And there's a little bit about Asperger's syndrome in here, but it's just, you know, pure poetry and artistry. And I think a great example of how someone can write autistically, but not have to write about autism, which is just, I think, great for all autistic voices and definitely something I want to pursue next. So right. there we that's go. Aw that's awesome. I mean, uh, uh, I'm more in awe inspired by you wanting to tackle poetry because that's the- Oh God, not poetry, just not autism. <laughs> oh. No, tackling poetry, I, 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 like for poetry. me, is actually reading it because, and I'm not to be like a snob of the road who get poetry because I'm not one of those people, but I, I actually really, really have to work to understand poetry. It's not instinctual for me, like prose at all. So I do need to invest more time in it to appreciate it and yeah. get there. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I am all for like as many pink haired uh, autistic <laughs> writers as, as possible getting out there. Um, uh, especially if, if, uh, the prose is anything like yours or as you described sharper than yours, then uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's a fantastic read. Um, okay, everybody, I'm going to introduce Sarah before she, uh, shares, uh, one of the most fun parts of the book. Uh, I loved it so much. Uh, but if, uh, you'll give me a moment, I am going to share Sarah's biography with you. Sarah Kerchak is a writer and retired professional pillow fighter. She is an autistic self-advocate and essayist whose work has appeared in Hazlitt, Catapult, The Guardian, CBC, Vox, and Electric Literature. Sarah is a graduate of the Humber School for Writers. She lives in Toronto, and I overcame my autism, and all I got was this lousy anxiety disorder is her first book, and it was published by Douglas and McIntyre. Sarah, if you would... All right. Because this is like basically a Toronto based reading, even though you're not all here physically with me, you're here in spirit in Toronto and Canadian writing now. Um, I wanted to visit the part where I talk about my start, which was at a Canadian music magazine called Chart that no longer exists. Um, and I also just wanted to give a little background to you on why this chapter was important to me in the way that it is. Um, because I speak to two audiences when I wrote this book and when I promote it. Um, sometimes I'm speaking entirely to autistic people, which is sort of cool. And we have our own kind of world that we understand, but mostly I'm talking to non-autistic people. And there's stuff that I do in the book that makes sense to me. And I think reads fine to non-autistic people that they might not understand why I have to do it. Um, basically anytime you feel anything good about yourself, and your autism, there is a segment of the community, especially parents, who will claim that you're trying to whitewash or glamorize autism. So it's very hard to explain anything that makes your life better in a way that you can make it clear that you don't think it makes everything perfect. So this chapter for me is a way of explaining something that meant a lot to me, but didn't necessarily fix things. But what it did was take the edge off of the extra stuff 
so that I had energy to work on the things that were actually serious about my autism and help me exist. So the first part of the chapter is there's a couple of digs at me and the industry I love so much because it's dying or dead. Um, I'll start here at the part where I started to integrate into the chart office as an intern. The chart office was by no means a cuddly environment. On the surface, it was probably more biting, sarcastic, and rough around the edges than any other microcosm of humanity that I'd been part of. The people who worked there, and the large cast of freelancing misfits who wandered in for new assignments, gossip, arguments, bizarre in jokes, were sharp tongued and strident. They'd grown up treating three to five minute packets of misery and, angry like, uh, misery and anger like a religion. Now dissecting, ranking, and cataloging, and waxing poetic on these melodic cries for help was their calling. There really wasn't any hope for any of them blending into polite society. Polite and kind can be quite different things though. Even my bullies had managed to be nice to my face for a while. After what I'd been through and how I'd coped, I wasn't particularly in the mood for nice anymore anyway. The music writers and editors I met during this period could be uncouth, but few, only a few of them were ever truly bad people. Under most of their abrasive exteriors lurked good-hearted nerds looking for the same. Many of them had been through shit they didn't want to repeat. They had defense mechanisms where their social skills should be, but they'd somehow managed to MacGyver their favorite tools of defense, sarcasm, burns, copious Smith, Smith's lyrics, into a means of bonding. These sweet and tender hooligans weren't exactly like me, but they were close enough. They took me in like a litter of cats adopting an orphan squirrel. I've only become slightly less prickly with age, and the cynic in me is leery of overstating the importance of finding your people in life. A true sense of community doesn't entirely fix everything. It can't cure everything. No autistic person, not even a so-called mild one, will see all of their needs magically disappear if they're lucky enough to stumble into the right subculture. Making meaningful connections can't eradicate sensory, sensory issues and repetitive behaviors, nor can such bonds completely, completely heal whatever wounds you accrued while searching for them. I have also become far more earnest or perhaps more comfortable with how earnest I secretly was all along with age though. And I refuse to sell the power of belonging short. Being around supportive, like-minded people can drastically improve your life. In addition to helping you survive, it can make you want to. If you've lived with that feeling for any period of time, if you've had to fight to find it, the sense of no longer being alone in the world can be transformative. Whether it's the island of misfit toys or Tetsuya Naito assembling Los Ingobernables de Japón. There's a reason why stories about loners and outsiders finding each other and finding a new future through each other resonate so much deeply with audiences. It's because they're true. Getting my first taste of place and purpose didn't make me feel like life was possible for the time. It actually started to make life possible. Tackling your myriad issues becomes a little more feasible when you're not living under constant threat of exclusion or worse. I still struggled with the same things that had always challenged me. I said weird things, mostly unintentionally. Basic navigation of the city I was born in remained an elusive goal. The most random and seemingly harmless circumstances could catch me completely off guard and overwhelm me in ways I couldn't always understand or express. The way that I was able to handle all of these things changed though. Once I was relatively secure that the bottom, bottom wouldn't fall out each time I made a mistake, my brain and body stopped responding with such brutal anxious immediately, immediacy every time I did. I didn't panic quite as much. My thought process didn't spiral so quickly or so deeply out of control, which meant that I wasn't always at risk of a full-blown meltdown. This left me with all sorts of energy that I'd never had before to work through my reactions, my fears, and my options. There's incredible power in having some sort of margin of error in which to live and learn. There's also immense power in working towards something that you care about, as opposed to acting out of fear. I'd wanted to be a writer since kindergarten, and I'd been deeply invested in indie rock and its various permutations for most of my adolescence. Interning at a music magazine gave me a chance to combine a craft that I had been carefully honing for most of my life with a very intense interest of mine. I was engaged and excited. Within that context, a lot of behaviors and social skills that I'd written off as useless, or in some way beyond my knowledge or ability, took on new meaning. The difference between, I need to figure out how to perfectly execute this social function before someone kicks my locker or maybe my head in, and figuring out how to perform this function would improve my ability to interview artists and interact with my fellow music critics, 
can be the difference between this is futile and I might as well die and I am going to try. Reciprocal conversation, for example, had always been a major stumbling block for me. It's not that I didn't care about what other people were doing or thinking. I just couldn't wrap my head around the necessity of asking them specific things to demonstrate this interest. My ideal conversation would be an exchange of interconnected statements. One person would initiate by bringing up an idea or a point in thought and another person could be interested in. The second person could then relate their own ideas or points to those initial statements. The first person could bounce further sentences that were punctuated with periods and the occasional exclamation marks off of that and so forth. As I have been repeatedly informed though, this fails to convey proper investment to most other parties. Apparently it makes you self sound self-absorbed and aloof. I tried to remedy my natural conversational style for years, but could not properly wrap my head around finding the right things to ask, putting them into the proper words, and then making my voice appropriately rise at the end of those assembled words. My awkwardly crafted and even more awkwardly worded questions stopped conversations almost as dead as my lack of them had. When my editors started assigning me interviews, questions suddenly became more of a necessity than ever, but they also immediately started making more sense. An interview is a pretty formalized social structure where each person involved has a certain role. If you're interviewing someone, it's your job to draw answers out of them. You can occasionally get away with a statement that could inspire further reflection. But most of what you will need to say to drive the conversation and achieve its desired ends are questions. When you begin an interview, you usually have a more structured idea of what you need to discuss than you would in casual conversation. If you're able to read other interviews with your subject as part of your preparation, you might also have an idea of what will come up and how it can be discussed. From there, it's relatively easy to figure out what you will need to ask to do your job well. If you're still not sure, well, you will usually have plenty of time to think the issues over, rewrite, and rehearse. You can even use notes during the actual talking part. Once the concept development and executions of questions started making more sense to me, I was able to start experimenting with them in the less rigid settings. Mutually invested statement-based conversations are still my ideal, and I think they get a bad rap. But now I can hold my own in a reciprocal situation to keep the normals happy, thanks to this process. Not sure that still holds in this new world. Transcribing those interviews gave me valuable insight into a lot of other aspects of verbal communication too. I hated having to listen to my own voice and winced through what it was always sounded like terrible questions in retrospect. This might be the worst part of pop culture journalism outside of the borderline poverty. I've yet to meet a single colleague who remotely enjoys the experience. But listening to these tapes did give me a chance to go over my performance the way that an athlete reviews game tape. I was able to observe the tone and the melody of my voice, the flow of my speech patterns, and the efficacy of my questions. I can make note of what sounded too awkward, too flat, too uptalky, and too fast. Then I would practice different phrases, paces, and sounds to see what might work better. My interview subjects, mostly charismatic and beloved performers, also provided excellent study material. Through talking to them and then re-listening to them speak and then typing out the words they'd used, I started to develop a better sense of what connects with audiences and why. I tried to best to apply what I'd learned to my own interactions. I tried even harder to give myself a break for the things I couldn't possibly change. On rare occasions, I even came to accept that my seemingly inherent awkwardness had some surprise benefits. I hated that strange, slightly too long pause I took to regroup between a, a subject's answer and my next question until I realized that it served the same function as a trained journalist's pregnant pause. While makeshift social, sk social skills lessons like these helped me to work through some of the things that were within my control, being around colleagues and fledgling friends helped me to accept the things that maybe weren't. Sure, I was still immutably weird in so many ways, but so were they. These people didn't just tolerate my many foibles. They had an ass load of their own. But within that bubble, parts of myself that I'd long considered massive at deficits no longer seemed like the end of the world. I may have been the only autistic person in the loose-knit community of music writers that I got to know through chart, although that's debatable, but I was never the strangest or the least capable of regular human functions. I don't suggest this glibly. As I've said, I'm not the type to argue that autism is merely a quirk or the next step in human evolution. I don't believe that acceptance alone would be enough to entirely address the needs that we have as a result of our neurology. 
However, there's nothing quite like immersing yourself in a culture of obsessive pedants with rigorous filing processes and meticulous records and rankings to make you realize that sometimes the line between dedicated and disorder isn't always clear. There's nothing like being welcomed into such a world to make you reconsider what you really needed to change in your life. Was it just yourself or was it also your audience? I believe that the way we currently talk about social issues in the autistic population is grossly oversimplified. Yes, we struggle with them, many of us quite severely, and can suffer great repercussions as a result. It's a serious problem, but it is a matter of much bigger than our own flaws. There are always other factors involved, from the behavior and taste of the people around us to the conventions of the culture in which we're interacting. If our solutions only address, address one aspect of this complex situation, we're not really doing anything to make autistic lives safer or more fulfilling. Learning and regurgitating someone else's often arbitrary rules of engagement doesn't guarantee that those people will grant you base level tolerance in return, nor does it guarantee that you'll find anything of value in the connections that you do make this way. I don't assume that what helped me would work for everyone. Even if signing every autistic person up for an internship in music journalism was a solution, it's not like there are any outlets left anyway. I don't know if finding an equivalent application for another autistic person's special interest will pay off the same way that mine did. And I'm definitely not, not going to tell you that there's a secret genius hiding inside of every autistic person just waiting to be sparked by the right subject matter. Falling into the community I did at Chart wasn't the only help I needed either. This book isn't called I interned at a nerd riddled workplace geared to my interests and everything's been going great since then. But something doesn't need to fix your life to transform it. Seeing some of your greatest gains from come from an unlikely source is the kind of experience that can make a person wonder whether what else might be possible for people like them. If most of my conscious efforts to fix myself and my social skills were painful failures compared to this potentially ill-advised misadventure, what other happy accidents and dipshit discoveries could be out there? What tools for greater acceptance and integration might we be missing when society is working from such a narrow concept of the social problems that autistic people face? What small breaths of relief and hints of a better future are we ignoring when we only look for solutions or cures? Thank you so much. I loved, that was my favorite chapter, uh, just, just in that personal uh, coming to Toronto for the first time and uh, navigating the space, but also that, and and when you talk about the Pillow Fighting League, there's, there's a real, um, participation as reader in that mm -hmm. evolution you take as not just writer, but as a self-reflective, really insightful person, like, you know, not, not just self-reflection -re for, um, you know, why, am, why am I the way that I am, but in, mm -hmm. in that way, that's really intelligent and wanting to, to dig deep into seeing yourself as a person in a, in a community. I am interested in, uh, mainly because of what you you talk about in the Pillow Fighting League chapter, where you you, you see Sarah Bellum, which mm -hmm. is your your alter ego in the in the Pillow Fighting League. You see her not just as the character in in this you know fictional narrative that you're participating in, but you start to see her compared to Sarah Kerchak, like like how successful she is in not being the evil person you wanted her to be and, mm -hmm. and, and all that. How has, and just a reader uh, watching that evolution, how has that evolution from, you know, pre-diagnosis landing in Toronto and working at Chart, how do you think your writing has changed over that period of time, if, if at all? Oh, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't, like, I, don't want to be some pretentious nitwit who tells you I had everything figured out as a teenager, but I'm really just getting to a point where I'm realizing maybe the way I wrote as a teenager is more what I need to get back to. Definitely informed by the wisdom I hopefully gained somewhere along the ways. But in terms of just, you know, how weird I was in my thoughts and my writing process then, how assured I was versus how little I am now. Um, and how many years I spent, and I'm only picking up on this now and realizing I need to correct it, 
Yeah. Observing writers that people like the way I observe people that people like as a kid and wondering like what's wrong with me here right um but just like getting to read other autistic writers um Hannah Gadsby has been a huge huge influence here because I mean Douglas is great but for me Nanette is structured like an autistic work of art just like the way it all loops together yeah. was I think the first time I was like no okay fine what I'm doing actually matters even if I can't find the audience for it now that's kind of what I need to pursue more. So right. yeah, it, it, I, it always sounds so, so flighty like, or anything, but like actually learning to trust maybe the voice I've always had is the next part of the evolution. So yeah, right. I guess it's another version of figuring out that cerebellum was fine all along. Um, time to be more me and my structure and my prose. Right. So you could, your next memoir could be uh, like, devolution or devolving how to find yeah it. it's just gonna be pure <laughs> cyclical thinking circular stuff right. I'll, I'll put footnotes in the back to explain how I got from one paragraph to the next <laughs> I'll grab the eight-year-old diaries and start editing them like a <laughs> like an old copy editor that's fantastic um one of uh, of uh, and I'm glad that I'm staring at your dad while I'm asking this question. One of the most important uh, chapters to me, um, as as a, a the mother of a kid with an intellectual disability, not the same, but mm -hmm. was how you talk about your parents, and you know, not just that you were lucky to be born to them, but that you were lucky that your parents were the kind of people who saw you or allowed you to be who you are without without um, putting on top of you the dreams and aspirations that uh, that parents have for their kids. Like what I dreamed you were going to be while you were in utero and you know, all of the things that, that parents do, whether intentionally because mm -hmm. we're, I'm a shitty parent or uh, not to talk about anyone else, but, but unintentionally, right? Like just the dreams. Um, how, do you think specifically, and again, I think you touched on this in the last answer, so I'm probably um, just wanting to dig deeper into something for my own personal mm -hmm. self. But how do you think that being the kid of your parents and having the freedom to think and express yourself the way you did affected you wanting to be a writer, if, if at all? Like, do you think that that played into that, that ability to, to self-reflect, being free well to I mean, my dad has always been a storyteller. And so he would like make up characters and stories and like write little books for me. And um, before I even knew how to write or read myself, I would dictate stories to them and they'd write them down on the bottoms of pages and then color in the tops. Nice. Um, so yeah, it was just storytelling was always a part of my life so even though I'm a writer and I tend to focus on the prose it that's what inspires me in any medium to the point where like even professional wrestling that's what I love about wrestling it's just it's like a really vital form of storytelling to me right. um there's also a photo of me as a baby in dad's arms in front of a typewriter because I actually just really like the sensory feel of it I have memories of being that young Sometimes autistic people have really creepy childhood memories that are very detailed. Um, some of mine are of actually just clicking the keys on this old typewriter that they had at the time. And there is a photo of me on it. Um, and I have joked over the years that that was kind of their like big league thing for me. Like my kid's going to be a writer and they ruined my life for it. But no, it's um, they, it was just anything that I showed a passion for it was like, we're going to do that. Um, the Titanic only comes up a little bit in the book, um, probably if I'd had more time to write it, because it was a very short writing process, or more time to think about it, I would have just included an entire separate chapter on that, because that was a huge one. Um, I, my grandfather came home with the National Geographic after the Titanic had been discovered, mm -hmm. and I just lived with it by my bed for like six months, staring at these photos in awe, and my parents just ran with it. Like, if there were local Titanic Society meetings, we'd go to them, and yeah. I'd be like this five-year-old talking to a bunch of old ladies, saying, Titanic, and um, 
I'll be a photo of me meeting Dr. Robert Ballard, which I do briefly mention in the book. And to them, it was as simple as our kid's excited about something. She's learning and she's passionate. We'll do everything we can to foster this within our ability and also our budget. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And I think also, I mean, there was a certain amount of privilege. We were not well off, but we had a safety net from my grandparents, which gave me just a about as much of the like struggling writer thing as I could while still being naive enough to think like, oh, I could make this a job. Um, so that kind of benefited me as well to make the choice to even try this life. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's good. And and I, I also, you know, in that chapter, you talk or the the introduction before that. And in this chapter, you talk about how you're specifically not wanting to talk to um, an autistic audience about this is the definitive life of an autistic person like this, you know, yeah, I, I like how you it's it's educational and informative um, without being judgmental. Although, uh, you know, as a, as a pro vaxxer, I absolutely love the chapter when you <laughs> the, the essay that you wrote. Um, it's never going to be any less relevant. Like, oh, click us now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's become the, the social media, you know, opening up social media and, oh God, am I going to do this? But, <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. great. Um, so uh, again, I'm always, I mentioned this just before everybody came on. Um, I'm always fascinated when I read memoir and I read, you know, little, little tidbits of your experience at chart and the pillow fighting league and mm -hmm. um, random people that you introduce us to throughout the memoir. I always, as a fiction writer, as a fiction thinker, um, I, I always think, oh man, why is there not a novel? you know, based in this, in this setting or, uh, you know, well, why is, why is there not a short story that, that uh, um, has this or whatever? And so specifically without, because um, I know there's, there's Scandi Noir, autistic protagonists and, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other uh, autistic narrators that exist in the world, but have you. Oh, no. Did I freeze? All right. No, I, I, that, that's happening for everyone. Okay. Um, you. Yeah. It's not oh. just you. Okay. But we're back. All right. All right. We lost you kind of halfway through. So let's maybe start that, that question again. Oh my God. It was so intelligent the way that I, <laughs> I said it. I can't. Um, so I, it, uh, speaking specifically about, um, I don't know where you lost me and I don't want to repeat myself, but when I, whenever I read memoir, um, and I, I did it obsessively with Sharon Kirch's, uh, book too, that that's coming up next week. I always imagine because I, I live fictionally, I see people and I imagine them in fictional worlds. And, and so I'm wondering if you thought about writing a novel, writing, anything either set in pro wrestling set in pillow fighting that has an autistic narrator protagonist or or anything well i'm absolutely dead serious about that autistic sex comedy that's mentioned <laughs> in the intro of the book let's talk about that <laughs> i yeah where i think autistic people are at a point where i mean helen hong's um oh what's it called the something quotient the kiss quotient would be a, a great example of how things are changing. But I mean, autistic people need all of the tropes that are tired for non-autistic people, especially non-autistic white people. Uh, yeah. since head white people. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up so cynical, there's like not liking any story that people could relate to because I couldn't. Um, but now I've hit a point where like, I had some really, really funny, awkward interactions in trying to get laid as an undiagnosed autistic teenager, <laughs> like to a point where, and uh, this, if it, the book ever gets written, I have to sit down and actually force myself to write it. It was like, you know, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie where they just like keep wandering and can't eat dinner anywhere. I was just ending up in beds with naked boys who didn't want to sleep with me it was just like going from one to the next and it was just as like tragicomic um I'm trying not to look at your dad while you're talking 
I mean, one boy, he wrote, read me poetry that he wrote for his girlfriend while he was just like sitting naked in this bed I was hanging out on the edge of at a party. Oh, jeez. The other one told me how hot his mom was. Oh, <laughs> so, what? Like, just this drunken, like, rapturous monologue about how beautiful his mom was. Holy can we? Yeah. His name was Callum. I've never forgotten that. I'm just going to name him Callum in the book when it comes up because why would I change it? Um, <laughs> but I don't know. It's just like I, even the act of like being horny is revolutionary for autistic characters right now. So there's yeah. just there's a lot of stuff that other people people have done already that is really really tired that I think would be really refreshing for autistic people to see themselves in in any way yes. Yes. and also I just really have the feeling first of all that it's funny because I still laugh about it all of these years later but water. I would really like all of that humiliation to have a point <laughs> like if I could turn it into a book then it would feel like oh okay it was it just that I spent my teenage years being really sad and lonely it's a funny book now so it, it would it would be hilarious that's not that's and it's not just something that that teens would enjoy reading I think everybody would enjoy reading it it's it's I mean you know there's a, a lot of talk that's been going on about uh autistic characters being used as plot devices right it, yeah it's impossible to pick up something or you know, turn a movie on or, and it's gotten to the point where I just don't turn movies on with mm -hmm. characters with intellectual disabilities because yeah. it does turn out to be a plot device and the, the movie or the novel or whatever gets destroyed mm -hmm. because of that. Um, what, I mean, it's hard to, to, I, I know you're an advocate and I know that you're um, wanting to get the autistic voice out there that isn't, isn't typified, right. By mm -hmm. autism speaks and all the, the, um, uh, narratives going out there. But what do you think we as readers and consumers of, of fiction and nonfiction that center autistic people, what can we do to, I don't know, not support or support a more um, intelligent and authentic voice or work. I'm not a hardliner who believes that only autistic people can tell autistic stories, but I am still waiting for the proof that other people can. Right. Um, and I think part of it is not just going to be about seeking out actually autistic voices. Um, it, it is necessary to have us not only for the authentic experience whatever you want authenticity to mean but simply from the fact that there is a lot about of our our lives that's internal and if all of the stories that are told about us are from the outside looking in it's even the most like empathetic observant dedicated like artist is going to miss so much so the descriptions have to come from us and they have to come from as many different people as possible um and that's both like for showing the diversity of autistic people and also to take some of the pressure off the individual autistic voices that exist out there yeah. because i mean we have a developmental disability we have social issues expressing ourselves is complicated enough when you add the pressure of suddenly having to speak for one in 54 or whatever the numbers are now we are not equipped to handle it yeah um i there are a number of reasons why writing this book was hard for me but one of the reasons i was like dry heaving over the toilet with stress every single day of the writing process was just the fear of letting other autistic people down and maybe that was a bit of a savior complex on my part. And maybe it was more about ego than anything else. Uh, but also the stress is there because there aren't other voices. Mm -hmm. And there are things about my book that I can't be for everyone. And there are probably ways I've screwed up and failed a lot of people. And that's, it's not fine, but it's like a natural part of the process. No one voice can be everything for everyone. But the people I have failed don't have another voice to turn to right now most right. of the time yeah 
Um, but it also, like, I'm proud of this book, but it's not the book I would have personally written if I knew there were other people that were going to write stories really? that could fill in some of the gaps. Like, I would have told things differently. I probably would have shared more of my own story in different ways. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, part of it is just going to be like, if you can foster more voices, mm -hmm. then more individual, authentic perspectives will come out. And then the next generation will be encouraged to tell more and more to, um, and also, I mean, from like an editorial perspective, um, editors have to be more open, not just to working with autistic people, but to working with autistic pros too. Yeah. Um, the, it's not just gonna be vo autistic voices telling a story that makes sense in a way to non-autistic people all the time. There's gonna have to be some give and take there too. Yeah. So yeah, um, I guess, I've lost my train of thought a little bit, but it is no, no, does like I think that's, no, I think that's it great. has to be a multiplicity of voices. Like it, it just yeah. has to be seeking them out and encouraging and fostering these voices. Yeah. Um, in a way that actually lets them be autistic and also you know every other facet of their identity too. Yeah, and I think you touched on this at the beginning, and I I wanted to to say something about it then, but now feels better. Um, you like you know the editorial perspective on books, right? Like needing mm -hmm. to uh, have a place on a bookshelf where they belong. I think mm -hmm. need to stop. Like I think that editors, publishers need to stop going. You know, thinking, oh, we've already got uh, an autistic person who wears glasses and has pink hair. Like, yes. <laughs> like it just needs to get to the point where there's a book in front of you and it's a good book. Yeah. You know, and again, not we've already done a book on pirates or we've already done like just to, to have a book in front of you and give it the opportunity to speak for itself. Yeah. As opposed to making an editorial decision to limit what you're presenting to the world. I think Douglas and McIntyre just shout out to them. They yeah. do a really great job at um, publishing diverse, you know, not just diverse voices, but just voices that, that are, are different and yeah. And Thing and and without trying to be something, without trying to qualify as as their that place on a on a bookshelf. Well, I mean, part of the reason I went with them too is because, like, their books helped shape me as a kid too. There were voices I never would have experienced otherwise. Um, Urshad Manji was huge for me as a teenager. Mm -hmm. So, um, was it called Risking Utopia? Was that the book? Um, anyway, it was one of I, her early works was Douglas and McIntyre. So, um. Kaylee, Kaylee can do the little, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So it was just one of those, like, oh, I'm actually really honored to be on like in this company and to get yeah. to work there. Yeah. Yeah. And Karina is a fantastic publicist, but anyway, I have one more question. I hope uh, you, you will indulge me. If you have any questions to ask Sarah, please uh, type it in the chat, direct it at, at Kaylee or, or just put it in the chat in general. But I really want to talk about structure. Mm -hmm. I was going to open with this question, but then I thought, oh no, I, I have a feeling that uh, <laughs> I don't want to just keep asking uh, follow-up questions. But okay. I loved the structure of this book. Um, that it was that each chapter is a step, you mm -hmm. know, towards a, a, an end, and each chapter had a funny title, and the most important part of this uh this book for me were the footnotes <laughs> just <laughs> not not just that there was uh you know bibliographical information dropped there but mm -hmm. funny funny like fucking Morrissey when you went <laughs> thing because I was a huge Smiths fan growing up and he's turned out to be a huge disappointment for oh, me. God, yes um but like just that almost I would say over half of the footnotes, I literally just dropped the book and was like, <laughs> oh my God, that's incredible. So I want to talk about, did, was that a conscious decision? Did you know, is that, is that just like, this is how I think. I think in, you know, parenthetical throwouts and, and stuff like that. Did you know? Well, I mean, the footnotes weren't even my idea, which I felt the need to clarify so many times because they're so me that I think anyone who knows me would be like, oh, that's typical Kerchak bullshit going on there. Um, and when 
they were suggested to me I actually wrote back like you're I feel like I need to warn you what you're getting into here um and I did like in many ways I didn't hold back what I was saying at any other point in the book but I felt I needed to like rein myself in on the footnotes because it it could have gone on forever it could have been I mean like Pale Fire is one of my favorite books I'm also like a really big fan of Richard Iowati's books and he just nerds out. There is an entire, I think it's in Iowati on Iowati. There's an entire rant against Argo that's in like a 10 point footnote in the margins. And it it puts a lot of people off, but I think it's hilarious. I just love him anyway though. Um, So yeah, basically I was like, try to be less Nabokov, more Iowati um, in the footnotes. Um, in terms of the steps, my original vision, and then I'll get back to the footnotes because I really am proud of them. Um, my vision was that I wanted each essay to use a facet of my life to highlight um, like a bigger issue mm-hmm. that we're facing more autistics and then to try to like take the microcosm of my one existence and highlight issues that I knew that my book might have an like might be able to reach an audience that had never thought about them before so I wanted to not necessarily exploit but maybe tweak the curiosity someone had for a personal story and make them think about topics that I didn't think were getting enough attention so that was in terms of the alcohol and the sex and um, just special interests socializing um, burnout was huge for me to like get out there um and I never considered the book a memoir. I was like, it's a collection of loosely connected personal essays. But once it came down to it, the only way it made sense to put it together happened to be chronological. So then it became an actual story. And then once I was looking at it, the only way I could in good conscience like name these chapters and put them out there was to make them like anti-steps toward success. Cause I'm like, really I do believe I'm more of a cautionary tape tale even though my life's not like, terrible but it if I had a choice I would like not want the next autistic generation to follow in these footsteps I really do want better for them and for me um and then yeah I, I really really do think in footnotes so that was a blessing that was handed to me especially as sort of the editing process got hard um yeah. and it's a maybe it didn't connect as well on the editorial vision at certain points and couldn't figure out how to communicate it. Cause even like 20 years into my career, I'm not formally trained in a lot of ways. And I wasn't really aware either as a writer or as a person of the boundaries I was allowed to have. So um, I, I maybe didn't stand up for some certain things I believed in. I did stand up for some though. Um, so as I was like really suffering through this editorial process, the footnotes were a way to like keep me amused and make me happy. Um, there is a footnote in the book that just says, hi, Eric, um, yeah. who's a mutual friend of Christine, who is here. Uh, nice Oscar shirt, Christine, um, <laughs> who I just happened to be actually in a group chat with Christine and Eric when I was editing the final copy of my book. And it was in the chart chapter and I met Eric at chart. Yeah. And Eric just joked, put me in your book. I said, fine, I'm gonna. (laughs) And I just happened to put the footnote in right there. And he like actually didn't believe me even when I sent the screenshot. I don't think he actually realized that was a real footnote until he got the book. Now he's really excited to be on the same page as Tetsuya Naito, who's not the naked guy, that's Endo, this this different Tetsuya. Um, Because we're like all big LIJ fans. Um, I'm very emotionally attached to Tetsuya Naito. And yeah, there were other points too. Like there's another part where I mentioned, in fact, Naito, because he is sort of like a very inspirational millennial figure who failed a lot and then rebuilt his life in a way that's more meaningful to him and his fans. Um, But his vision was like, he doesn't believe in like, if you don't give up, you'll achieve your dreams. He thinks that's a little too fanciful, but I agree. Um, But his point was like, he prefers to say, if you don't give up, you can see the light, which is like a level of hope I was willing to work for. I think that's actually what I say in the book about it. However, I was not seeing the fucking light when I was editing it. Um, I just couldn't, like, could not in good conscience leave it. So as I'm like sitting there stewing, not seeing the light, 
I threw in that footnote about Daisuke Sasaki, who also has a stable of misfit professional wrestlers. Um, and it's somewhat less hopeful than Naito is. Um, and his like life is about giving up, which is a promo I quote like all the time. I think the whole thing is like, life is all about giving up. You give up, you start again. It actually makes a lot of sense. This is what you're taught in jujitsu, in fact. Like you learn how to tap and give up so that right. you don't break your arm. Right, for an right. arm bar you start again um but he's a, like a fatalist and he's been threatening to retire for like the last 10 years of his career every time something goes wrong which I really respect because I think about quitting like every day <laughs> I just have yeah, no other skills to go to I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm like how is this not going to find its way into <laughs> a novel or story <laughs> of some kind <laughs> so yeah as I was sitting there all miserable and I was like you yeah, know screw it Daisuke Sasaki's getting his own footnote and I'm just <laughs> oddly I think that might be the footnote I'm the most proud of simply because it was it accurately reflected where I was at the time um yeah and also I I just think it's great that Daisuke Sasaki of all people is now featured in like a book okay. <laughs> in Canada yeah sure. That's awesome. I, I have way more questions, but we are um, coming to our time. I could, I could sit here and talk to you all day. You're such a joy. Um, I am going to open it up to anybody who ha has any questions, Kaylee, and then afterwards we're going to do a raffle. Um, Karina at uh, uh, DNM has given us a copy of um, Sarah's book, so we will do a raffle after any other questions. Uh, yeah, we have three questions. I've already closed the queue just because we are um, a little stretched for time. Um, this question is from Becca and Becca says, hi, Sarah, thank you so much for this event tonight. As an autistic woman from Detroit, currently living in London, UK, I've only recently become aware of my autism last year in my mid thirties in the midst of a global pandemic. I've since ordered your book and followed you on Twitter. I'm grateful for your advocacy and many of your words resonate with me slash my lived experiences. I've recently had some of my writing published as well and often feel like the written word is much more effective than my speech slash social interactions in communicating what I want to say. Do you feel similarly? If so, how has your writing helped you to understand your autism? And in brackets, we have also feeling like Hannah Gadsby has been helpful. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, I probably wouldn't write if I could talk like if I was able to get even half of what I, I seem to have accomplished on the page at least I hope I have verbally I probably could have pursued something else even as much as I love storytelling but there was there's a lot I've been able to rectify by being able to put it on a page and just make myself clearer in some way um and I think it's only now like what a year into this book being into the world and talking about it and what 21 years into my writing career and 12 years into my diagnosis that I am actually starting to figure out who I am as an autistic writer and um, be able to like know what that means and better understand myself and how I can express it through written words so hopefully i'll have a better answer for that next book if it exists <laughs> i hope so all right wonderful our next question um is from hannah hannah says hello from a an autistic attendee infiltrating a non-autistic event you're you mentioned writing autistically about topics other than autism what does it mean to write in an autistic way so for me it's I mean, part of it is the intensity of the focus um, and yeah, just like being able to dive deep into something that you are passionate about in perhaps a way that other people either don't feel or haven't been allowed to feel. Um, uh, and there is, and I don't know how to explain it, and I, I'm going to reference Nanette again because it is just one of those things where seeing everything like tied together differently. I think the way she like loops everything in at the end is a very autistic thought process. Um, so I wanna, not to write exactly the way that she explains things, but more trust my own thought process of how things connect and try to get that down on a page. Um, 
and also just the weirdness of the interest. So uh, uh, one of my other dream projects right now, other than the autistic teen sex comedy, would be a collection of essays about art, about fucking things you shouldn't. So yeah, there's like the necrophilia section, <laughs> and then there's objectophilia. Um, and all of the Duran Duran songs, well, there's two of them, but there's the robot one and there's the leopard one. Uh, but I think there's something autistic about being that into the weird characters who would do that. And then the way I would want to figure out how they connect and then trying to figure out how that appeals to me as a more like obsessive, reflective fan. Um, to me, that, that would be what writing autistically about other topics is. And I think that that's as individual as anything else about autism. I'm sure it would look very different for other autistic writers. Yeah. I can't, I, I have thoughts going in my head about, <laughs> about how as a reader, I would, I would know if you didn't tell me, you know, something was written by an autistic writer or written autistically I you know I don't know if I would know probably not like it's it's interesting there's like I don't like to speculate about people's neurology I just think it's inappropriate for me to do so at the level that I'm at but there's definitely like fandoms I'm in where people have picked out specific artists and been like damn and it's just like every autistic person I know in the fandom instantly is able to seek it out in a way that not only can other people not see, but we're not even able to explain to them exactly what it is we're seeing right. half the time. It's just like, no, there's just something here that is different. Right. Yeah. yeah okay. Any other questions, Kaylee? I see. Yeah, we have one last question from Colleen. Colleen says, speaking of cerebellum, I am a neuroscience professor at U of T and I teach basic science around ASD. I wanted to read your book and come here today so that I can develop a broader perspective and have a better understanding about the full spectrum and talk to my students, some of whom have ASD themselves, about the importance of neuro neurodiversity and the value that it can contrib contribute. There was an article in a neuroscience journal called the, World's, the World Needs More People with Asperger's, when that was still a term. I don't teach this perspective, and I want to, and frankly, I'm ashamed that I haven't. The question is, what would you want my students to know about ASD, knowing that many of them will go on to medical school or graduate school? How can I help them to embrace neurodiversity? Okay, so I think, first of all, don't ignore critics of neurodiversity, but please be aware that a lot of the criticism that has been published on the topic completely fails to grasp what neurodiversity act diversity actually is. Like it's as ridiculous as if someone decided to write for say, I mean, it's been in the Guardian, but it's also been in the Quillette. You'll see the same voices. There's Thomas and Jonathan and whatever. And it's always like as ridiculous as, you know, neurodiversity says it's good to kill puppies. I don't agree with that. And then everyone who actually believes in neurodiversity will be like, oh, you made this up. This is yeah. not connected to any of the actual points here. I mean, at its, in its essence, the concept of neurodiversity is simply that different brains exist and that maybe we should believe there's some validity to them. Um, for me, the concept of my neurodiversity mostly means that every person is human and deserves to be treated as such. And that doesn't mean that they don't have issues or severe issues or like needs that actually have to be addressed. But it, and it doesn't mean that anyone's life is like perfect and doesn't need any assistance, but it has to start from a place of like actually accepting that they're a human being and needs to be addressed as an individual. Um, another important point for me would be that a lot of the like popular stuff that's being shared about neurodiversity is about employment. And that's necessary because I think it's about 16%, depending on the study, of autistic people who are employed full time. I'm not part of that like population and I never have been and I probably never will be. Um, so that's something that needs to be addressed. But when every article turns into like, what a good little tech cog we'd be um that, that's not actually about making lives better that's about like 
how we can be fit into capitalism and be ground down by that just as much as everyone else, but with slightly different terms. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's a little bit hippie of me and it's really hard to accomplish practically every single day, but it is something I think is worth trying for is to meet every single person where they are and figure out not just what like makes them more tolerable for other people, but what makes life more tolerable and more valuable for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's super important. I, I'm, I'm not sure, Colleen, if you have any follow-up to that, but that, that to me feels um, like perfect to treat the individualism as opposed to the collective, I think is very important as a, a person who's experienced the the this is the basket of tools that we use for a kid like yours mm -hmm. this is the basket of tools you have available and when nothing in that basket is useful yeah you're left to figure it out right and mm -hmm. that refusal to to see a person as as someone who who is or needs something outside of that right without an organization saying well it's all here why 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 is this not yeah appropriate for you or whatever that's kind of the state of autism education in ontario right now too yeah yeah sadly it's uh yeah a lot needs to change yeah for sure um colleen i'm not sure if you had any follow-up to that if that if that feels like an important question i i don't uh, i don't want to just sort of leave you hanging there is it okay i'm on mic yep yeah okay <laughs> um I didn't really have anything in particular, Sarah, as a follow up to that. I mean, I, I can think of it in terms of autism and I can think of it in terms of so many other issues. I mean, I have so many students right now who have mental health crises going mm -hmm. on and some of them have autism on top of that. And there's just, it's our whole society needs so badly to just hit the reset button and yeah. and try and accept people as they are. And I'm just really aware that the people that I work with are at this point, they're graduating. So they're about yeah. three, four months before they go to grad or med school. And, you know, they want to help people. Most of them are doing the jobs because they want to help people. Yeah. But, but in your book so often, they're helping people in a way that looks helpful to someone who's not autistic yeah. or, or someone who might not even have a family member or a friend who's autistic. Mm -hmm. And so it might be well-meaning, but uh, it's not, it's insufficient. Clearly it's, it's not working. So. Yeah. yeah. It's a case of, I think a lot of symptoms people know how to treat, but they don't know how to treat the cause of those symptoms or even address what is the cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I am so grateful for everyone, uh, all of your questions. Um, I mean, it's it, it, I knew it was inevitable that we were gonna um, go down uh, the non-writing uh, conversation path, which I am uh, happy to do and excited to do. Um, I am now going to ask you, because I'm desperate to hear that you're working on fiction, but I'm fine with whatever you say. What are you working on right now? What can we look forward to? Um not much of anything right now but uh, I am kind of finishing up a book proposal I haven't told my agent about um, and officially it's a joke just to get me back in the swing of writing proposals but right. I would love to write it um, once that's done it'll be time to focus on I would like to do something more in the essay vein about autism more specifically about how narratives about autism or harming autistic people or even just making our lives annoying even if it's not harming us um, right. from things like autistic versus with autism to the concept of burdens which I do touch on a little in this book um oh what I wrote one down the other day and I was so proud of it and I've totally forgotten it but yeah it would be me as an autistic writer talking about just the way that narratives have contributed to our suffering or lack of thriving in so many ways. Um, and then, yeah, it's gonna be the autistic teen sex comedy. That's the, yes. the other vision, that, that's the dream. I, um, I, like, I actually have like a little Dharma doll all set and that's the goal for it. So if I ever wanna color in the other eye, I'm gonna have to finish this book and sell it. Right. 
I look forward to that. I can't wait for that. Um, thank you so much for coming, Sarah. Thank you everybody for coming. We are going to do the raffle. Um, I'm excited. If, if you win the book and uh, you already have the book, uh, um, don't fear. You can share the address of a friend or the address of someone else that you would like us to have Karina mail it to. Um, and um, you can email me to junctionrights at gmail.com if you are the winner. Kaylee, drum roll. Have all our names in here. And our winner for this evening is Isa Iseri. Isa Iseri. Hey, she was here. Hey, she was here. Yeah. Oh, are you still here? I'm here. Yes. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Thank I, you. I look I, forward to I, reading it. I was staring you. at you for I was staring at you for most of the thing and then you're here. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. That's I right. think everyone yeah. shuffled. <laughs> yeah. So send me send me an email and uh, with your your mailing address and I will get that to Karina and and she is super on top of things. So you'll probably uh, like honestly probably get it before Friday. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. It's a fantastic book. Um, again, Sarah, thank you so much for coming. This was a thoroughly enjoyable chat. I hope you, you had a good time. I, hope I did. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. I really appreciate it. Um, we've got two more readings this, uh, this April. Next week, I sit down with Sharon Kirsch to talk about her Montreal-based memoir. It was such a lovely read. And then on April 25th, I get to sit down with my very good friend, Marissa Stapley, to talk about Lucky, which is an incredible book. I knew the character long before her name hit the page. And uh, she's got exciting news about a TV series. So thank you, everybody, for coming and join us again. Thanks, Kaylee. Thank you.